Then we have dew claw removal. This is probably the one the least amount of people have an issue with due to the fact that one, dew claws aren't on every dog, and two, dew claws are pretty much useless, and three, the fact that more common people in the public will experience dew claw rippage versus anything else. So first off, what is the dew claw? The dew claw, or as I will say dewy, is basically the remnants of a dog's thumb. It's the fifth claw on the side of a dog's foot. Not all dogs have dew claws at birth. Some may have them only on the front and not the back. Some may have both on the front, and some may have double dew claws like in Great Pyrenees. They can seem to be a bit, how can I say, creepy in some dogs, and you wonder how they don't just come off because they seem very unattached. Some may look more attached than others, typically front ones compared to the back. Dew claws can help a dog gripping items like bones as well. Wolves had dew claws on their front feet in order to help with traction when running in snow, but not the back. In some breeds, like the Norwegian Lunderhound, the dew claw is actually very important. Historically, Lunders were puffin hunting dogs on rocky cliffs, so the dew claws assisted in climbing rocks by giving extra grip. Fun fact, they also have six toes. Not just a dew claw, but six full toes. And yes, it looks as weird as you think it does when you first see it. Another breed that has multiple dew claws is the Great Pyrenees. While peers normally have one dew claw on each front paws, they have two on each back. The concept of why is they're the same with the Lunderhound, for traction. Peers worked in mountains guarding sheep, so the extra traction helped. However, beyond those two and other breeds where it's standard, like Beaucerons, dew claws don't really serve a purpose for most dogs. Well, not that they don't serve a purpose, but that purpose isn't needed for the average dog, and the risk of injury to the dew claw is far greater and worse than the problems associated with removing them. Now, some people will tell me taking off a dew claw does cause harm via certain muscles in the foot, and removing it can slowly tear tendons and whatnot, but personally, I think the injury of dew claw rippage is far worse than a chance of a tendon tear. But I will acknowledge the risks of weaker traction when running and the possibility to tail the carpal muscles in the dog's wrists. But like I said, I think the issues with them being ripped off is far worse and far dangerous. Dew claws are removed normally when the pup is two to five days old. There is no general anesthesia, but the vet can numb the area with a local anesthesia. Once ready, the vet will clean and sterilize the area, and then make a surgical incision to remove the claw and the claw's bones from the body. Stitch up with a few stitches or surgical glue, and you're all done. Sometimes antibiotics are given as well. Recovery proceeds as well as the dog grows, because the bones are not fully developed yet when the claw is removed, and most don't have any issues. For older dogs, however, this is more complex. Older dogs that have dew claws removed normally have them removed due to a pre-existing injury, typically from ripping them off when they're playing. This version of the procedure is under general anesthesia, and the area is cleaned. The vet then makes a surgical incision or cut to remove the offending claw, muscle, and bone. The incision is then stitched up and a bandage is put over the entire paw. Antibiotics are given. A dog may also need an e-collar, or the cone of shame, if said dog is prone to biting their paws. Normally, this takes about 15 to 30 minutes to complete the surgery, not counting coming out of the anesthesia, and recovery time will vary, but unless something like infection sets in, there's usually no issues. As for why people have issues with it, well, like I said, a lot of people don't tend to mind this one. But I have noticed that it's mostly people with dogs who have dew claws that think the procedure is barbaric and should be banned, and those with dogs who do not have dew claws, whether it be naturally or surgically, don't mind it. But it's the same deal as the other two. People like to exaggerate things. They think that removing anything off a dog, especially at a young age, is awful. But the dog can't even see or hear, so they certainly can't remember. Most grow up as if nothing happened. Here's what's wrong with dew claws. Say you're playing with your dog in a grassy field, all happily and then suddenly, your dog yelps and you see blood. Rushing over, you realize your dog got its claw stuck on some tall grass or dirt or something like that and ripped it off because it was moving too quickly. 
Yes, this is the most common injury to do claws, ripping. I have seen this happen firsthand to one of my previous boss's dogs, and she literally came running into the clinic as we were closing up with her bleeding dog. Dew claws get ripped off, and it happens a lot more often than you think. Plus, that sure as hell is gonna hurt and be remembered. Removing it when the dog is too young to remember is far better than the dog remembering tearing it off as an adult and having to take weeks to recover. Many sporting breeds have these claws removed because while moving in thick, swampy brush, the last thing you want is a useless claw getting ripped off and bleeding. It was historically done for the same reason as tail docking and ear cropping to prevent injury because early man couldn't risk losing his dogs, yada yada yada, you've heard this all twice now. Another reason they can be a liability is, in modern days, is ingrown nails. As a groomer, I've seen so many people forget to check dogs for dew claws, and as such, while the rest of the nails are short, the dew claw can easily curve inwards. Dew claws don't reach the ground to be worn down naturally, so they don't get worn down and thus continue to grow normally. This, the same issues can result in surgery to fix the claw's nail. Simply put, dew claws, while useful for some, are not useful to most. I would say the injuries that happen due to dew claw rippage are far worse than removing it at a young age. Remember, the only real issue can, that can arise if you remove the dew claw is less traction when running and the chance to tear, tear the carpal tendon, which I don't believe is it much compared to the greater risk of ripping it clean off as an adult dog and that painful memory being remembered. It can take weeks, maybe months, to heal from a dew claw rippage. And last, we have debarking or bark softening. This is the most recently invented procedure and is the most controversial in my opinion. Before I go further, I need to explain something important. Debarking is not what you think it sounds like. After the procedure, dogs can still bark, it's just much softer than normal. I will repeat that. Dogs can still bark. It is just more quiet. The term debarking is misleading in that regard, and why I say it should really be called bark softening. But anyway, debarking, devocalization, or vocal cordectomy is a surgical procedure in which the dog's vocal cords are altered in order to reduce the volume of a dog's bark. While I can't find any consistent evidence on how this procedure is done, the general idea is while under anesthesia, the dog's vocal cords are altered via the animal's mouth using a surgical laser or a medical punch and very rarely scissors, but lasers seem to be the most common. Sometimes the surgery is done by an incision on the throat, but that's usually more invasive than going through the mouth, so most do it via the mouth instead. Usually after the procedure the dog doesn't have any long-term complications, but I have heard of sometimes the throat constricting inward a little, but usually nothing that's too life-threatening. Now, unlike the rest of the procedures on the list, debarking is not for working animals. It only recently came around, and most came around due to dogs barking in urban populated areas. Dogs bark for a number of reasons, namely communication, but they can also bark because of stress, boredom, fear, and a few others. If you've ever lived by a neighbor who's left their dogs alone for long periods of time, you've probably heard the barking or if you live in an apartment that allows dogs and your neighbor, neighbor leaves the dog alone for periods of time. Normally, barking is not an issue, but it becomes an issue when it's non-stop at unwakeful hours of the night. No one wants to hear a dog bark at 2 a.m. in the morning, waking people up. Sometimes, if the barking gets so out of hand that, at least in the USA, people can file a noise disturbance complaint and if all goes through, you know after 70 years because stuff takes forever in the US, the owner of the dog can be forced to surrender the dog to a shelter. So I know what a lot of people are saying. There are plenty of ways to stop barking. And true, I don't think debarking should be a first option, but there are dogs that do not learn via traditional methods. Most common ways to deal with barking is checking to make sure there's no medical pain or medical stressors, using certain training methods, bark collars, and a few others. But there are just some dogs out there that do not learn. Not all dogs learn not to bark. In fact, anyone who owns a miniature schnauzer will know that no matter what you do, those dogs bark like crazy and do not stop. 
Put a bark collar on, they will bark right through those shocks. Spray water, and they will bark even if you spray an ocean on them. Ignore them, and they are persistent little buggers. If you could tell, I have an issue with miniature schnauzers being incredibly loud. Having shown them at shows, when they see another dog, they don't stop. For hours. And I mean they screech. It's almost as bad as a Basenji scream, but not quite to the level of Basenji screams. I've been around plenty, both pet and show dogs for that matter, and they sound awful. You would think they're dying with their noise, and I'm sure any handler with minis can agree with me here. All in all, unnecessary barking is awful, and some dogs don't learn. But I have a more personal story I'd like to tell. I used to work at a kennel where there was once a mini schnauzer who would often there. Was a show dog but ended up falling out, so she was instead given to it as a pet. That dog was the bane of everyone's existence in that kennel. You did anything in the kennel, it would let you know how it felt. Walked into the kennel? Bark. Turn on the AC? Bark. Move a microscopic dust particle? Bark. That dog was crazy, and even outside, if it saw another dog, it went yapping like no tomorrow. The bark was a high-pitched screech that hurt my ears to the point I told my boss I'm not working with that dog to save myself. And many other people who worked there followed suit as well, lending us to basically having to draw straws to see who would have to care for them. The owner even admitted us that the dog had caused issues with her neighbors who asked her to do something. While no formal complaints were ever filed, they certainly didn't like her or her dog, and she was worried someone would file a complaint and she would be forced to give the dog to a shelter. She had tried bark collars, not craning, minimizing stress, nothing. Up until she finally decided it was time to debark her dog as a last ditch effort. After the procedure, the dog went from being probably the most annoying dog ever to probably one of my favorite dogs ever. I could be next to her and not have to grab earplugs. She would still bark at everything, yes, but the bark wasn't screeching anymore and she became a lot more tolerable. In fact, a lot of people started to love her. She was well behaved even before the procedure, but because of the barking, it was insane and no one wanted to be near her. But after, she was an angel, I could say. And that's the story. Now, what is the justification for this procedure if there are plenty of other ways to stop barking? Other than the fact that some dogs don't learn, it helps keep animals out of shelters. You're probably thinking, how does dirty barking even relate to shelters? Well, if people complain enough about a dog barking, the owner of the dog can be forced to surrender the dog to a shelter. If debarking helps keep a dog out of a shelter and no other methods to stop barking work, I'm all for wanting to do it. The main goal is to keep animals out of shelters, and if the dog gets surrendered because of its barking, it probably won't be adopted ever again if the shelter is honest because no one wants to do anything. That and, well, most shelters are wusses who refuse to tell anything other than positive reinforcement. Remember, I don't think it should be a jump to first option to look when it comes to problematic barking, but if worse comes to worse, I'd rather debark than surrender a dog. Some myths of debarking claim that the dog suffers emotionally and that only cruel, inhumane people do it. No, not at all. Dogs who are debarked don't even realize that they are debarked. In their minds, they're still barking. It doesn't matter the volume. A loud bark or a soft bark is still a bark in a dog's mind, so they don't notice. They only know bark versus not bark, not the sound. As for cruel and inhumane, no! Trained veterinary professionals who know what they are doing, how to perform the procedure in the most careful way possible with the least amount of harm. Another myth is that people saying that they do debarking is because they're lazy and don't want to train their dogs. Often, people who debark are good pet owners who are out of options and at the end of the rope. If a pet owner is going to debark a dog, it clearly shows they care enough about their dogs and neighbors to warrant not having to surrender a dog. If the owner was truly lazy, they wouldn't do anything about it. I think debarking should be allowed, especially when it comes to deciding if to put an animal or shelter or not. The last thing any owner wants to do is surrender a dog. So there you have it. That's the four big dog modifications. After all of that, you may be wondering why some people think it's cruel. I don't think it's the question of, is it cruel? I think the real question here is, what is the justification for these procedures? 
It is true most dogs aren't being used for their traditional work. Heck, most people think working dogs itself is cruel. But what is the justification if, for the most part, it's for the human owner's preference and not the dog's preference? Well, my argument is, what's wrong with me choosing to get a responsibly done procedure on my dog by a professional? Last time I checked, you're not the one paying for my vet bills, food, cleaning up after it, etc. My dog is my dog and I get to choose what I want done. It's not painful, it doesn't cause any long-term issues, and there's very little chance of complications. Don't go giving me the stink eye for cropping my Dane's ears while you go and get your dog's reproductive organs torn out. Yeah, a lot of people forget that. Spaying and neutering is a heck of a lot more of an invasive surgery than anything I mentioned, especially spays that require vets to go in and take out specific organs. Everything I mentioned except for debarking does not require inside work. It's all done on the outside. The AKC supports all these procedures, and yes, some of you threw up because I just said that name, but when the USA is one of only maybe five countries left that support the procedure, and with big name organizations like Humane Society of the United States and PETA existing to manipulate us, we need to fight for with any methods we got. I don't blame people for thinking this way. It's very easy to see things one-sided in the world, especially on the internet. But the moment you say you're right and claim anyone who doesn't agree with you is an enemy and don't bother to see where the other side comes from, that's when the issues arise. Another issue arises when one seemingly meaningless pet laws spirals out of control into strict, insane pet ownership laws. A pebble can become a bullet if it flies fast enough, and just as easily one law that bans something small now that uneducated people see so one-sided can easily end up to making us unable to even own pets in the first place. Those animal rights groups are not your friends. They don't want us to have pets anymore. If you spay and neuter every animal out there, what's gonna happen? I'll let you think of that. In fact, I know some people have clicked off this video because what I'm saying is true, but they don't want to hear it. And you know what? That's fine. But when push comes to shove, don't blame me for why we can't have man's best friend at our feet. Look, the simple point that you should be taking away from this video is this. Don't judge others for getting a responsibly done surgery on their dog, even if it's for cosmetic reasons only. You aren't the owner of the dog, you aren't paying for the dog's expenses, and there are far worse things we could do to our dogs, but cropping, docking, new claws, and debarking are not one of those. We both love our dogs, croppers and non-croppers alike, and that's what we should be bonding over. Not making enemies because we can't agree on something like this. Hey, extra big thank you to Judith Boren of Brackbar Dobermans for the help with this video. She provided me with a lot of information, especially on cropping, and she's been awesome. She's been raising Dobermans for over 30 years and has produced AKC, Canadian Kennel Club, UKC, and FCI Champion Dogs, as well as titles on agility and obedience. I would highly recommend her if you're looking for a Doberman or information on Dobermans as well. Thanks again.